So yes, this is the talk with evil in uh, the B room. There's humans talking about doing good. Okay, uh, full disclosure, I myself, um, I do work in the Texas Medical Center where I help scientists do good things because they pay me. Um, I do have the slides and code samples online, and I will be showing this at the end, so if you want, you can get your cameras out if you've got the right kind of scanner. All right, so let me tell you a story. Um, back in 2010, I had um, an opportunity to sprint at the same table as a lot of the core developers. And so I met uh, the people that are still developing, and they are very much like uh, Travis. You know, these are wonderful human beings. They are uh, well-meaning. They are sane. And that's why we've got what we've got. And um, it's, it's quite ironic then, and I feel enormous gratitude that uh, we've got this result. And, and the irony is that Python is wonderful for our communities too. It's not just about the do-gooders. The mad scientists and the evil geniuses, we have a place here. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. I'm going to show you how metaprogramming is an ideal toolbox, whether you're the mad scientist or the evil genius. And for those of you, if there are any, I'm going to try not to use the word do-gooders, altruists, or humanitarians, whatever you like to call yourselves. You know, you're welcome to. You'll benefit. OK, so we have these two different concerns. Um, the mad scientists, we do things because it's cool. I mean, look, you, you stitch the body together, you connect it to the lightning bolt, you go, it's alive, and that's just awesome. And, you know, the evil genius is, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of just a means to an end. It's not an end in and of itself. And I'm going to be coming from um, more of a mad scientist perspective, but if you are evil and a genius, you'll see how it applies to you. Okay, so generally, a mad scientist well, you know, think of all the classic stories for you evil geniuses. What do they do? They, they turn, you know, dead body parts into living things, or they hit something with a mutation ray and make it different. And that fits in very well, then, with metaprogramming, you know, programming about the program, taking a program and giving it things it didn't have, you know, oh, let's give it wings. Oh, let's uh, turn the head inside out. That should be fun. <laughs> and so this is the equipment that we've got to work with. Uh, synthetics of different kinds, uh, monkey patching, and the little known, seldom used, sitecustomize.py. All right, synthetics. So a synthetic function could be built by a number of mechanisms. There are more complicated ways of going about this, but using abstract syntax tree or just hacking Python bytecode directly. I'm going to show you the easy way. You create a string. Here, I'm just presenting a string literal. And you turn that string into a function using the exec built in. Exec takes a string of Python code and a dictionary, treats the dictionary as a namespace, and it runs the code. And any variables or functions, classes, whatever they get defined are now inside that dictionary. So when you're done running it, the keys of the dictionary will be whatever you defined within your code plus built-ins. You always get that if you don't provide it. If you gave it a built-ins to begin with, it'll use whatever built-ins you'd provided. And then I pull that function out, and it's real. I can run it. That is an honest-to-goodness real Python function as if it had been in source code to begin with. That string could have been the result of a user query, user input, assembled from inspecting a database or a web service, whatever. And it's every bit as much of a Python function as anything else. Um, so yeah, that's pretty awesome, I think. But that's the mad scientist. Classes are a bit easier. We don't have to do string parsing. We could. But classes, and for that matter, for the most part, objects in Python, are just dictionaries. Python is all about dictionaries containing other dictionaries, pointing to other dictionaries. It's just a flock of dictionaries. And um, in fact, the memory of Python at any given moment is, is kind of like a giant JSON document. So functions in Py yeah, well, sorry, methods in a class, if they're just regular methods, are just plain functions. 
Now, when you actually call a method using an object, some extra magic happens, and you get a bound method. Um, but when you're creating a class, you just pack it with some functions. So these functions could have been synthesized, or they could already exist in Python code. I'm just going to create a dictionary, and then the built-in function type wants the name of the class, the tuple of ancestors in order, if you have any, and then the dictionary. And the class method, I mean, the class uh, statement in Python, all it's really doing is it creates an empty namespace, runs the code that you've indented inside that against that namespace, then passes that namespace to the type built in. That's all that was really happening. So synthesizing classes is actually trivial. Um, now, typically, there would be an init method. I didn't bother with that. But yeah, there. And I've got my class. I can create an object, call a method. It's real. It is every bit as real as a class that had been defined in Python code. Modules are even easier. A module is just a big, dumb namespace that happens to have a doc string, which is hopefully populated with something useful. That's all a module is. And so you make, there's types has a method of, of creating a new module. There you go. That's how you do it. It's trivial. You can stu shove stuff in there. It does, doesn't have to have the same name. And then the sys module contains a property called modules that is a dictionary of all the modules that have been loaded so far. So whenever you do an import statement in your code, what Python does is it calls the import function, which is a built-in, which in turn checks sys.modules to see if it's already loaded. If it is, it just hands it to you, whatever it might be. Typically, it hands back a module. It could really ha You could store anything in sys.modules. And so you could store a, a user-defined function in there, and it would work just fine. The downstream code wouldn't know. So there you go. Now, in, in a different file, I could import synthetic, call a function on it, and there's just no way to tell. At this point, it is every bit as real as if I had defined that as a separate .py file. So that's some pretty powerful stuff. You could integrate stuff from users or other places. You can use this to create domain-specific languages. I could read a file in some other language, parse it out, start synthesizing bits, and turn that into in-memory Python modules, classes, whatever. I could inspect a database and create new classes from that, and then use those classes to instantiate objects that might be rows of that database. And I can monkey patch. We know where we're going. Monkey patching. Monkey patching, as opposed to traditional patching, is where instead of modifying source code, you modify the memory at runtime. Right. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> so um, I just showed you how it's just dictionaries and dictionaries pointing to other dictionaries. Yeah. OK. So modules are trivial. You, you can take your existing module, and if that module was implemented in Python, you just hack on it. Now, some modules are actually implemented in C. That's not an option to you. So oh, just synthesize a replacement, and then shove that into sys.modules. Now, the thing is, if some other piece of code has already imported that module, then that other piece of code would have the original um, unsynthesized version. I mean, if they've imported the module and you modify it, they get the modified version. But if they import the module and you went full body snatchers and synthesized a replacement, then that other piece of third-party code, it's still got a good version. So you really need to do this early enough in your main. Monkey patching classes. Again, if the class is not implemented in C, if it's just implemented in Python, just have at it. <laughs> and it's going to do the right thing. OK, and so here I uh, show an example. Um, it's in there. Now, notice that the disguise is not real. Notice that when I look at my class.spam, it shows the true name, because I did not bother to fake it out. It's doc typing. You know, if you're just trying to alter the behavior, don't worry about it. Uh, an IDE might notice. 
You can even monkey patch individual instances of an object. In this particular case, I've got two objects, both of the same type, and I decided to um, add a method to one and not to the other. Now, this is where I was talking about bound methods. When you go and do a lookup like x.spam, and spam is what, what's really happening. The Python machinery is then looking at the class. Oh, well, x is inheriting spam as a, as a method from the class. So we're going to take that function, and we're going to make a special wrapper that's binding that function to that value x, which will then be filling in for that cell, blah, blah, blah. Just use this thing, and you're good. So that's it for monkey patching. So now that I've got these things, synthetics and monkey patching, that's enough that I could pretty much do whatever I want when I control at least all the way up to the main uh, module of my code. As long as, as I'm executing my script, I'm good. But what if I'm running a bash script that's calling a Python script and I don't want to be changing that code base, but I want to change its behavior. So that's where this comes in. Um, so it turns out, and you can read about the site module in the Python standard library, that after some various things are done early in startup, Python attempts to import this module automatically. If it fails, no harm, which it almost always fails. But if it succeeds, it runs it. So in this scenario number one, you have um, a Python script that maybe you don't have direct access to. It has a shebang line that's an absolute path to a Python interpreter that you don't actually want to be using. We can fix that. So um, I'm going to show my, the corresponding site.customize in three parts. Just some obvious globals here. Uh, so I'm going to be using import the built-in function as a kind of landmine. Because I know that this code, sooner or later, is going to import something. And blah, right. OK, then here's my replacement. This is the landmine that I'm going to deploy. Now, site.customize.py loads so early that sys.argv hasn't even been defined yet. So um, I'm going to check for that. <laughs> And if uh, sysargv has been defined, now I know everything I need to know to take the current running heretical Python interpreter and blow it up, replacing with the Python interpreter that I wanted. <laughs> Why not? And just for funds, I, while I was, uh, I, I'm printing out you know, what modules were loading before uh, it, I finally had sysargv defined. And it's not a lot, just user customized. But while it's still starting up, we need to be running that original import. OK. And then finally, if the, the Python interpreter I want is the Python interpreter that's running, then I'm not going to do this. You know, I'm only going to put a, a landmine in enemy territory. And there you go. So now. As long as sitecustomize.py is somewhere that Python can import if it tries to go import site customize, then this is live. And that could just be by editing the Python path environment variable, setting it to the directory containing that particular sitecustomize.py. There's a code example. It's pretty straightforward. OK, another thing that happened to me years ago, um, again, third party code, Bash scripts, calling Python scripts. And these Python scripts wanted me to be a privileged user. Or, and if I wasn't, they were going to not execute. But I wasn't a privileged user, and nor did I have a note from my mother. And I don't think I need either of those in this situation. OK. There we go. So um, I'm creating a module, synthesizing it. And now I could have just hacked. In this case, it was using the PWD database to figure out whether or not I was worthy. And I could just hack the PWD database directly, but just for fun, and because it was only calling the one function, I synthesized a replacement. So there's my synthetic replacement of PWD. And 
there you go. Now, I could have, this is really overdone. I could have just, if I'm synthesizing a replacement, I could have just had a, a pwd.py at the front of my Python path, and that would have had the same effect. Either way, I'd have this function here <laughs> that would, in this particular set case, says, I'm whoever you want me to be, and the code executes. All right, so this has a lot of fun opportunity. You know, if you want pi to be equal to three, if you want to take sine and cosine in the math module and reverse them, if you decide that they should be based on degrees rather than radians, all of these things are possible to you. And you can go further with, you know, start modifying the machinery and the semantics of Python itself. And driving your coworkers slowly or quickly insane is a lot of fun. <laughs> but there could be consequences. And as vexing as it is to have to justify your plans to these feeble-minded coworkers who don't understand your genius, you do have to address their concerns. So if you're going to patch third-party code, do it seldom and do it publicly, unless you're the overlord and they, they're your minions and they just have to obey. Um, be aware that although updating monkey patching is going to be more stable than patching code, because you're going after the semantics. It could still be broken with an update. Um, and you know, it, when you're dealing with C, uh, you're usually going to have to synthesize a replacement. But of course, your synthesis, your synthesized replacement, could be delegating as much as possible to the original. And there you go. We're in a golden age. And I hope you guys appreciate it. Python 3 has made these things even smoother and easier. <laughs> and you know, I, I want you to just go out there and have fun. <laughs> so um, wow, I actually did this a little quicker than I thought I would. Hooray for me. And as promised, uh, as we're doing questions, if you guys want to find out where that, uh, the notebook and the demo code is, there you can go. So there you go. Do we have any questions? Yes, sir. I get that mad science does it because it can. So what would be the evil genius motive for going to these lakes? Well, um, in the two examples I showed, like say you've got um, some shared computing. OK, the question was, when would an evil genius go to these links. I mean, obviously, the mad science is. is uh, so consider the, uh, the scenario one in sitecustomize.py. You've got some bash scripts that you don't want to modify that call some Python scripts that you don't want to modify because the code was not good like code out of the Anaconda ecosystem. And you've got a Python environment that is in the Anaconda system ecosystem and has all the bits you want. And now you want this code that you don't control to be running in this environment that you do control, then the site customize.py would kick in. Um, in other situations where, well, like the example, where you've got code that is frustratingly doing the wrong thing, and you want to slap it, and um, although you could patch, maybe you even got uh,